Welcome to the Wired to Hunt podcast. This week on the show, I'm joined by the 2023 National Deer Association Deer Manager of the Year, Doug Durant, to discuss a more holistic approach to managing wildlife habitat for deer and other critters. All right, welcome back to the Wired to Hunt podcast brought to you by First Light and their Camo for Conservation initiative, which supports the National Deer Association. But today's episode is with the recipient of an award from the NDA just recently. It is my friend, Mr. Doug Duran. He is a land consultant. He is a uh, well-known modern philosopher of the hunting and conservation world, I'd say. He's a really good guy. He's a wise man and a friend. And he today is joining me to do two things. Number one, we're going to chat a little bit about the hunt that I shared with him this past season in September um, as he gave me access to a nearby farm through his sharing the land program on which I was able to hunt, killed a really nice buck and a doe out there back in September. So we're going to talk about that hunt a little bit. We're going to talk about his sharing the land program, which helps connect landowners with access seekers folks who want to get out there and find a place they can hunt. He's got a really cool way to help people do that. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time together talking through Doug's approach to managing wildlife habitat, managing his private property, managing the Duran family farm in a way that's good for deer. It's good for deer hunting, but it's also good for the rest of the ecosystem. We talk about this biotic focus, the larger biotic community, the larger ecosystem, and how we can do things that are good for our hunting, but also good for everything else out there. This is a theme I talked a pretty good amount back during the Back 40 Project, for those of you who remember that show and that time period. But I want to bring it back to the table here today because we are kicking off a month-long series on habitat work. And one of the themes I want to continue to return to is how we can utilize the properties that we manage, not just for shooting deer, but also to make sure that everything else around us is flourishing too, because all of these things are connected. So the fate of the birds and the bees and the rabbits and the soil and all that stuff is intricately intertwined with the white-tailed deer and all the other things that we care about, you know, obviously as hunters. So What we're going to try to explore here today with Doug and probably in some of the other conversations this month is how we can do these kinds of projects in ways that help our hunting and everything else. And it all circles back. So that's the plan today. That's the conversation we're going to have. We're going to have some other folks this month that are more tactic focused. We're going to talk to some people that are going to be, you know, talking through how to strategically place or create food plots or strategically create bedding improvements or, or, different ways we can funnel deer through a landscape the way we want. But that's that's not today. Today, we're going to take a kind of 30,000 foot overview. We're going to step back and we are going to look at, you know, how can we approach this habitat management way uh, with a little bit more diverse viewpoint, I suppose. So as I mentioned, the first part of the conversation is a little bit more hunt focused as far as our story and my experience with Doug. If you just want to get right to the habitat conversation, Fast forward maybe about 30-ish minutes. That's about when we get into the habitat dialogue. I think it's some good ideas. There's going to be some good ideas for us all to ponder. There are some good questions to think about. And uh, hopefully this will leave you with a few new ideas, maybe a new way of looking at things, and some inspiration to get out there and get to work on your own back 40 if you have one, um, or volunteer on a friend's property, or volunteer in public land. Any way that you can get out there and get your hands dirty, improving habitat for critters it's fun it helps it makes a difference and i've certainly seen the positive benefits in my own life so that's my pitch today hope you guys enjoy the episode thanks for being here now let's get to my chat with mr doug durant all right here with me now on the line is my pal mr doug durant Welcome back to the show, Doug. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. This is fantastic. Great to catch up. It's it's always a pleasure, and I love any excuse to get to chat with you more, but today is extra special 
I've got to embarrass you by talking about in front of you the fact that you are not only famous now, but award-winning. You are the famous <laughs> and award-winning National Deer <laughs> Association Deer Manager of the Year now, Doug. Congratulations. Thank you, Mark, and, and congratulations to you. I can turn that right around on you to, and being uh, appointed to the Board of Directors oh, for NDA. Yeah. It's, uh, it's okay. great that we're both involved with the organization, and, and it's really, uh, I think it's been really gratifying to see how the organization has um, evolved and yeah. uh, I think by awarding me uh, and my efforts this this award, um, it's maybe a you know it, they're they're really highlighting the kind of stuff that we've been working on, and I think that's the most important thing, right? The ideas that we've that I've been working on, the group of people that I've been working on it with, and you know, and how that impacts the bigger uh, conservation community and and deer and deer hunting. So yeah, thank you, but. Um, it's that that's the cool part about it, about it for me is that it's highlighting all these ideas and and uh, and other folks that are working with me. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a great uh, example of NDA putting their money where their mouth is, kind of, and and showcasing someone who's you know doing the work that that we want to be doing and talking about and using your platform. And it's and it's not just about killing a big giant buck right it's it's really about the bigger picture kind of things which we'll be talking a lot about today so it's sure yeah it's great um and, and and maybe slightly controversial i mean i i wouldn't uh i wouldn't shy away from the fact that there are times when i say things that are um and stand for things that there might be people in our community that would have a little bit of uh issue with and uh but i i think that uh i think that not only nda but you know, guys like you and I can have these conversations and sort of thinking evolves over time. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, uh, that's part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, well-deserved. So I'm happy for you. I'm glad you got that recognition. I'm glad that people are seeing, you know, I don't think there's many people who have not yet been exposed to you and, and what you're doing, but if this is an opportunity for more people to be exposed to that, I'm, I'm very glad for that. Yeah. Um, so, so with that being said, then I want to rewind the clock, maybe four months now, four, five, four months, something like that, back to September mm -hmm. when you were so gracious as to have me out to your farmhouse to spend some time hunting in your neck of the woods. Um, we didn't get to do a podcast right after that. I did a show with Tony talking about the story from my perspective. But today, what I was hoping to do, if you think this is a decent idea, I was hoping to spend a little time kind of getting your, your perspective on, on my time there and my hunt there. I want to talk a little bit about how I got access in your program that I mm -hmm. kind of got to trial run. Um, and then I want to talk about a little bit of what you alluded to there a second ago, which is kind of what you and your property has come to represent or stand for in the deer hunting community. So that's that's my framework. I just want to make sure you know I prepared for this, Doug. And uh, I did too. I'm ready for you, Mark. <laughs> so with that said, uh, I came, I hunted, we <laughs> spent some time together, we had some great conversations, and then before you knew it, I was gone. What did you think about our time together? What did you think about, what was your perspective on the hunt, the story? Well, I have to say that... Uh, one of the things I like about you and people that I, I become friends with and stay friends with, it's almost as if the conversation never ends, right? It's like, sure, there are segments to it, but I felt like when you pulled in, uh, you and Lauren pulled in, um, we had done some preliminary discussions, but you, you guys pulled in and, you know, I'd worked with Lauren before, certainly have been hanging around with you long enough. And it was just like, we just picked up kind of where we left off. Yeah. That the same under the saddles are still there and but the 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 good fun part of it um was still there and the real discussions that we've had about deer hunting and conservation and land management and and philosophy and uh, and all of that it just, we just picked it up so from my perspective um we had a bit of an outline i mean it was heck it was the you got here on the opening weekend of the bow season which i think mm -hmm. was like 
the 15th or 16th of September yeah. this year. Nobody hunts here that early, which was a really interesting thing for me, you know, knowing that I'm not uh, a bow hunter. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, to 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 kind of see how that was going to play out. Honestly, I was a little like, oh, I hope this works out pretty well because I know there's always a little bit of pressure to to produce, and you know, and especially here at the Duran Farm, where it seems like every time cameras show up, um, that we have great success and great fun and all of that. And but that's it's almost like no matter how times you, how many times you do something, you still get that feeling in the pit of yeah. your stomach, right? And that's For one sure. of the cool things about hunting. Um, so what I thought was most interesting about it was that you and I had some exchanges. We, uh, we, we went back and forth on, with some Onyx uh, maps, and uh, you know, I pointed out a couple of things, and you asked some really good questions about what's going on up there. And I should point out to folks that because of some arrangements that I have with bow hunters, with, um, the, with some bow hunters, I didn't want to hunt, have you hunt the farm. But I, have a, um, I manage the property next door, and have the hunting rights for it as well. So I was able to give you access to that. Um, and, and my friend who, who's a part of that program with me over there, uh, Chip Bird, um, also uh, was gracious enough to say, heck yeah, have Mark, uh, he can hunt over there. Um, and so we don't know that property that well. I know this place like the back of my hand. So that time of the year, a bow hunter taking the thoughts and the stuff that I have noticed um, having that exchange, um, and then you pulling in and, and we had a really good conversation about where you're going to hunt, how you're going to hunt. And, um, well, it all worked out pretty well. So from that standpoint, it was a really cool, um, it was a really cool beginning to it. And then sort of the, the setup and it wasn't anything different than I would, I do like with my bow hunter guys who come here, the, the short standers, as I like to call them, um, those guys, you know, they come and they ask a lot of questions and then they go out and kind of do things on their own. You kind of went, you went a little bit different than that, really. You really were interested in what my perspective was on it all. Um, and I guess you were most interested in the local knowledge there. And there's nobody more local than me. Um, so I thought it was, we had great fun. The whole, the whole, you know, not only did we have good, you have good success, I thought we had great fun. Yeah. I- I can't argue with that at all. It was a it was a really good time, and I do think that, you know, when when I'm whenever I go to hunt a new place, the fun of it is putting this puzzle together. Right, you've got like a blank slate, and you're slowly trying to put things together. And so you arrive to a brand new place like this, and it's like, okay, I've I've been able to look at the maps online, and I've got all these ideas, and I have assumptions, but then coming in, it's like, hey, you know. If you have the opportunity to like fact check a little bit, why not? So, yeah. so yeah, some of the most valuable time spent, there's two things that were the most important for me. One was when I got is from a hunting perspective to clarify. Um, one, when we arrived there and we've got that big map on the wall, of the farmhouse. And I was like, Hey Doug, let's talk about the map. And I was like, here are the things that I was looking at and I was thinking, and can you, like, is that right? Is this really what this thing is? Or is this really what I think it is here? And you're like, oh yeah, that thing's this thing. Or like, oh no, not that, that. And then you or one of your buddies there mentioned, oh yeah, and down in that spot, I was pointing at this drainage. And um, they're like, yeah, down that drainage, there's apple trees. And when I heard that, that was like, whoa. That was like such a key little thing that I would not have known from just looking at the maps, right? But as soon as I heard that, I knew like, okay, we got to zero in on that and and pay attention to that. So that was number one. And then the second thing, you know, the first night I rushed into it. I was I was overexcited and I wanted to hunt and I thought, okay, I can hunt based off of just what I think is there on the map. And so I went and, you know, as you know, that first night, it, it was different than I expected where I went. It didn't work out the way I thought. I couldn't see what I was hoping I'd be able to see. I, I was assuming I'd be able to see a lot and learn a lot. And I, I just didn't put myself in the right spot. So that next morning, you know, I told you, I was like, hey, you know what? I don't think I should hunt tomorrow morning. I think I need to like lay eyes on a few more things. And, and you know, we talked about the fact that you drive around on your side by side a lot. And I thought, you know, I, I wonder if I could just tag along with you as you drive around to, you know, pretend like you're doing your farm chores. And I could <laughs> see a couple of these things like with my own eyes and maybe actually set up a stand, you know, 
without the deer noticing anything's different than Doug doing his normal stuff. And, and so that was, that was key because that was a, what was allowed me to go and see that apple tree spot that seemed so intriguing and then be able to confirm like, oh yes, this is exactly what I hoped. And then be able to get in there and get set up in the right spot with, you know, the, the, the cover of the UTV being there. You know, if, if I, if I tried to go in there without that, you know, those bucks might have been bedded nearby and spooked out of there. Maybe they wouldn't have moved through in daylight two days later. Um, the doe might have spooked worse and not have been there the next day. So so those two things were huge. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have your local knowledge and your amazing chauffeuring skills there on the side-by-side. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old Can-Am comes in handy. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, that, was a, that was an interesting little drive. And I'm glad we were ready, right? I mean, part of it was, okay, I'll just take you by here. And you're like, no, no, I, I think I'd like to be ready to go and maybe set up. Because why drive by there twice, right? Yeah. So we went by and I kind of went, there's the apple tree. And what about that walnut tree over there? And I don't know, it was 35 or 40 yard uh, distance. Yep. And But a, but a, 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 a farm road uh, that goes up through there that gets traveled a lot. So we went past it. I slowed down. You kind of looked at both. And I remember your eyes kind of went like this. <laughs> yeah, I like the looks of this. We went up past, like I would often do, just checking on things. I turned around, came back down. I never shut the Can-Am off. Yep. I just sat there. Lauren stood up in the back. You hopped out. And I'm just observing you this whole time because, you know, I'm taking lessons from the master. And Watched you go over there, same same look when you're up in the tree, you got up in there and you looked over and your eyes were really big, like, this is, <laughs> this is really this nice. Is the spot. If, you rem- if you remember, there's the cornfield that we drove up through that that road mm-hmm. comes up through. Um, there's water and tag alders down on that bottom, which comes into play later, of course. And then um, bedding area up above and, gee, you know, it's just, there's just so much about the terrain of that property. It was so cool. And I don't know, Mark, were you in there? 10 minutes it seemed like you got in and out of there yeah to get set up yeah it was something like that it was pretty quick i just i remember getting in there getting my sticks and saddle platform up there i trimmed a couple branches confirmed range on where i thought deer might come through and then it was slip right out try to walk my exact path back in so i didn't lay any more scent than i had to i noticed that Hopped in the can-am and off we went yeah that was and and i mean it was a slick setup um and then you left it alone until the next morning, as I recall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then and um, you parked over by the buildings, walked in on that road where, again, there had already been that, that tractor and the, the ATV and the farmer goes up to the ridge over there. Um, all that activity had been there. So you guys really were able to make a, a pretty stealthy entry there. Yeah. Yeah. It worked out. Worked out very, very well. Better yeah. even like, I, I knew it was going to be good, but I, I could not have predicted that it could have been that good. Right, two days in a row, two deer. Uh, I mean, it, it was it was it was the dream scenario. It's everything that you hope for, but you know, nine times out of ten, when you find a spot that you think will be great, you know, nine point nine times out of ten, even the best spots don't actually work out. Right, so it really really worked out. You know. Um... I know you've told the story when you were talking with Tony that uh, so that first morning you, you killed that doe and you knew you'd killed her. And, but being the, the ethical hunter that you are, you gave it an hour before you went after her and she went right into those tag alders down there in the bottom. And, you know, I remember marking it on Onyx and looking at it and everything. And that deer wasn't, that deer wasn't a hundred yards from where you shot it. Yeah. I mean, pretty much straight to the West. And, um, I remember getting that call from you. Uh, gee, uh, this is really strange. And you are describing what happened to me. And you said, well, I already took the head off of it because it's clearly the deer that I shot, but it, it's half eaten. And what an interesting thing um, when folks get a chance to see this whole thing when the, with, with the, the episode that you put out, <clears throat> I'd ask them to look at um, Bobcat uh activity um since then there was a whole kind of speculation right we have a neighbor who's got yeah, a bear on 
Yeah. And, and, um, uh, I remember Ronella was like, ah, as a coyote, you know, it's like, yeah, this doesn't look like what a coyote does at all. And, um, there's a bear in the area, so maybe that, but man, that thing had to be right on top of it, right? I mean, it had to run by it and, and smell it. Um, but then recently I've seen some um, studies and some work done on um, bobcats. And remember how it had the hide peeled back and it, it's yeah. like it removed the back strap and clean that was taking the meat between the ribs, hadn't really touched the rear end hardly at all like a coyote mm-hmm. typically would. To see all that was just, I mean, it was just fascinating to me. And, and, and I know to you, we speculated yeah. about it a lot. I got, actually got a lot of questions about it. And then putting the trail camera up and getting nothing. That was the but, most surprising. I couldn't yeah. believe that something else didn't come to get, get a piece of it too. Well, the a coyote went by and kind of gave it a, a, a glance like this. Yeah. And that was it. Uh, really weird. Vultures and a hawk. And then after about a week, a, a grinner, a possum got in there and he worked on it for a while, but yeah, it was pretty, uh, it was really interesting. The whole thing was really interesting. There was something foreboding about it when we got there and looked at it. Yeah. It seems like the rest of the wildlife in the area kind of felt the same way apparently because they, they steered clear. There was something, yeah. something not quite right. Well, it would have been know- interesting, you know, if that was a diseased deer, you could have wondered like, can they sense something here? But she mm-hmm. wasn't. She was not CWD positive. So it wasn't right. like there was some kind of problem that, you know, a predator could possibly somehow sense. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's a thing. Um, but, yeah, I don't know what the ex- I have no explanation, except it was interesting. So, And for me, from my management perspective, not only from my deer herd, but also from the disease issues and all those concerns that I have. Here was a six to eight year old doe. She's a big old girl. Um Obviously, we didn't, I guess, we, you, you didn't, we, there was really nothing there to salvage after it had been, um, everything that had been done to it. Um, but that she was, um, CWD wasn't detected, yeah. um, was a little bit of a surprise because it seems like with older deer, we're getting more of that. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but not. And uh, yeah, the whole, the whole event with that doe was just really uh was just really interesting and it's and it's been on my mind ever since it's just it's, so there we have yeah it. it was it was bad luck um bad luck that a predator got her so quickly but on the flip side very good luck in that i killed two mature deer in your area that six to eight year old doe and then probably a four-year-old buck and both mm-hmm were CWD negative or, or not positive, I guess is the result. Um, right. so, so yeah, that was, that was lucky. And I've been happily eating that buck, um, being very thankful it wasn't positive. So, uh, yeah, so that, was, that worked out well. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, so you talked about the fact that, right, you have this permission next to your farm and you were able to grant that to me. And we talked, you know, this summer about me coming up and hunting with you. And we talked about, you know, well, maybe I could get you access to this property next to us. And then you had the idea like, Hey, if you want to hunt here, why don't we treat it just like anyone else in the sharing the land program that you run, Doug? Um, and why don't you run through that process and we can kind of, you know, show you what this is like. And it gives us a great opportunity to talk about a little bit. And that's what I want to do here now, Doug is, for people that don't know about sharing the land, can you give us a rundown of, of what the program is? What could someone expect if they wanted to get involved in this like I was able to? So sharing the land is a private land access initiative that myself and a group of other people started a few years ago and, and have been sort of experimenting with. And now it's become, you know, now it's a real thing. And uh, it's a it's a cooperators network in, in which we connect <clears throat> access seekers and private landowners to the purpose of providing conservation uh, cooperation on properties and in exchange for access. So that access seeker is spending some time helping um, on the conservation of, on a property and in return they get access to it in whatever way they work out with the landowner. And in some cases it's, it's you know, wide open access and in other cases it might be very limited. Um, the real theme of it is, is that people are providing, um, uh, that they're, they're providing conservation benefits to either that land or somewhere else. So 
one of the questions I first started asking people when I when I started thinking about this was, what's your contribution to conservation? And uh, really, it started with with me with a guy who had been volunteering for some of our local conservation programs. He's a young guy, and in a con- conversation with him one day, he had told me that he lost his. Uh, his uh, turkey hunting access. And I was like, well, what season do you have? And he said, well, you know, told me what season. I was like, I don't think I have anybody hunting the farm that weekend or that week. So if you don't find another place, let me know. And I'll, we'll be able to work something out on the farm. And, and he goes, well, that's very nice of you. I was like, look, man, you're volunteering to do this conservation work for the community, not necessarily on my farm, but for the community. So that was sort of what motivated me. Um, so, SharingTheLand.com is where you go to do it. And there's an opportunity for access seekers, which we have a lot of. And I will tell people right now that um, Cal and I did a podcast when he was here recently uh, for the deer season. And um, boy, we just got hundreds of access seekers and two landowners signed up. So as you might imagine, we have a lot of supply on the, or I'm sorry, a lot of demand on the access yeah. seeker side, but less supply. So we're approaching a thousand access seekers who have filled out conservation resumes. And these are folks from all over the country. And we have only, but still a lot, I think, 30 properties in different parts of the country. Interestingly, I get a lot of requests to hunt here. And then we have an, there's another property that's not far from here that we're just started getting access to. And as you might imagine, landowners are a little... Um, they they like slow walk this in access seekers are like, heck yeah, let's go. And, you know, yeah. landowners like, well, let's, we'll see how this all works out. So we, we can understand that a landowner would, would be a little cautious, right? I mean, this is their place. This is their thing. Uh, this is their property. <clears throat> so um, there's been a lot of interest from landowners and then they, it sort of takes, there's a number of steps we kind of have to go through with them to, for them to really em- embrace this idea. But the conservation resumes are really important. The fact that these access seekers are, are you know, I mean, it's a resume, just like if you're applying for a job. And so with this um, idea that we're, we're connecting people, um, put your best foot forward as a, and not, you know, filling them full of baloney or anything, but that, that an access seeker really has some uh, something to offer. And, and, you know, we've had landowners who are looking for very specific things, like I need a carpenter or I need a um, somebody helping me with prescribed fire and those sort of things. And so, of course, that kind of thing is in higher demand than somebody who goes, well, I can come and help you, I don't know, fix fence pick or up rocks. roll a fire or something, pick rock, <laughs> you can always pick rock. Um, but so when I when people ask me, well, what can I do to make myself more attractive to a landowner? And I was like, well, develop your conservation resume, join an organization like a like a, a Pheasants Forever, or go to you know uh, university extension classes. Go to these landowner days where landowners are learning about um, land management, and go there and learn the same things that they are. And gee, you might even meet a landowner there. Um, the idea, of course, is that we're trying to be a meeting place and a connector. But what we really want to do first and foremost is to um, highlight these stories and 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 put examples out there. And we've been doing that. Uh, we recently filmed some stuff with uh, uh, Onyx down, and we went to a place down in Iowa in, in a farm where it's actually a native seed uh, company who became both a sponsor of sharing the land, but then also became a participating farm. And we had about a half a dozen people who came out there and who helped for a day of, you know, on a native seed farm, there's a lot of manual work. And some of it was like digging plants, undesirables out of a a particular field. And then we were doing hand stripping and that kind of stuff. And then we went back and we filmed the day of hunting as well. So they had a real, you know, great arrangement there. And it worked out really well on both sides. Had a a blast. We went pheasant hunting. Um, We've also, uh, there's, there's these properties in North Dakota that I was talking to you about that where they're doing shelter belts and removing wire, but then also doing plant, other kinds of plantings. And, um, and then the exchange was they got to come back pretty much whenever they wanted, as long as they contacted the landowner to Upland Bird Hunt. Um, one of those landowners just contacted me and said that he um, is also now interested in limited um, deer hunting. 
because um, they're deer hunters. And, you know, it's sort of like with me, I'm not one, I have this arrangement with these bow hunters for the farm. Um, and I have the, the, well, it's a lease arrangement that I have next door. It's a management lease and it's sort of a hybrid. I help manage the property and um, where you were able to hunt. Um, so bow hunting's kind of out here. And then the opening weekend of gun hunting, my brother and my nephews and, well, we had a, we always have something going on. It seems like with, with, you know, meteor this year, we had a thing with Can-Am. Um, but then the rest of the season, the people who were my, who are my conservation cooperators, access seekers, um, had access to come in. And then, gee, the, the, the later bow seasons, um, the, uh, the, doe derby antlerless hunt and then the, the holiday hunt and we did squirrel hunting we did we've we've done some foraging we've done um uh man we just had days where people got to come here and shoot and you know just a lot of different things that you can you can think of so what i ask landowners to do is to think about what it is that they do on their property and then what are some of the other possibilities and we list some other possibilities so you don't have to give up, you know, 100% access. It's sort of like, you know, it's almost like you have a menu of things that, that one, this, this is the menu of things I need help with. And then here on the other side is the menu of things that I'm, I'm willing to um, provide access for. And then we, what we do when the, these things come in is we try to match them up. And really what we do is, is send the, the, the most likely conservation resumes to the landowner. And then they, Take, kind of take it from there. There's an agreement involved, and there's, um, you know, there's insurance involved. There, they can the landowners wonder about liability, and there's some insurance policy that they or the, the access seekers can get. And so we've kind of, kind of run through every you know um, issue that we can. So if people are interested in it, and boy, this 2024 is the year of the landowner. We're going to be doing a bunch of. Uh, recruitment of, of landowners. I'm going to a thing this Saturday where there's a bunch of landowners who are presenting. The following Saturday, I'm going to another one. I'm out at Pheasant Fest then after that. So we're really going to try to recruit more landowners because as I said, we have plenty of demand and not enough supply, and especially in areas where you could imagine. Um, one of the things we did last year, also working with the National Deer Association and with Pheasants Forever, is that we did a learn to hunt in the early season um, during the bow season, because it was uh, DNR sanctioned, we did it. We were able to do a gun hunt in September. It was the weekend after you were here, yeah. I think. Yeah. And um, man, we had you know t we had fifteen properties. It was almost like fifteen hundred acres, as it all adds up. And um, twenty two new hunters, twenty two mentors, um, and some of those mentors were the landowners. So they took you know folks out. And these are guys who are, you know, interested in hunting big giant bucks, but they also understand that, holy moly, I got a antlerless uh, concern here, a management concern. So all of these things kind of come together. We can introduce people to hunting, get them out there um, early in the season before the, the best bow hunting is going on. Um, and we had a real successful hunt. I think we took 12 or 14 deer. Uh, we had we did a, a butchering demonstration, um, and he, heck, even one of the landowners, because it was sanctioned, and the, as a result, the, the landowner said it was okay, they could shoot a buck. And so he's sitting there in the blind with one of these hunters, and this buck comes out, and the the access or the the learn to hunter was like, mm, you know, boy, that's really cool to see. And he goes, you want to shoot it? <laughs> so can you imagine? I mean, the landowner got so wrapped up and so interested in this, and I don't know who had the bigger smile, yeah. that hunter or the landowner. That's so cool. So that that whole thing of where you're getting something out of it, I get so much out of it. I mean, you and I had a blast together, but it's not that much. It's no different, really, when I have my 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 uh, cooperators, access seekers come and we do things together. And it's just, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. And that's one of the things I keep telling the landowners. It's really nice to do this and it's really fun to do it. And then you talk to the access seekers on the other hand, you know, on the, uh, with the same idea that you, this needs to be beneficial to the land. It needs to be beneficial to the landowner and it should be fun. And let's talk about what it's like to be a good guest. And you could do a, you could do a seminar on what it's like to be a good guest. You really could. You're, you're a great guy to have around. Thank you. 
Thanks for saying that. Um, yeah. It, I, you make a good point that that actually wouldn't be a bad podcast actually, actually either. Like an episode just talking about how to be a good guest or how to be a good hunter on somebody else's land, right? I mean, there's some certain etiquette. There's a certain uh, set of things that can help you maintain access and permission by doing the right things, by helping out, by creating relationships, um, all those different types of things. Um, sometimes we assume like, oh, it's just obvious, but not always. So that's more than just a compliment, which I thank you for, but also a good idea. Um, so yeah, something to think about. Doug, with, with this, like you're talking about this menu of different ideas and you, you mentioned the menu could apply both for the access seeker and the access provider, right? So the access seeker, they can have a menu of things that they can add to their conservation resume, like all these different skill sets or experiences. Um, but then on the flip side, for the landowners, there's always something more you could do, right? And, right. and that's kind of where I want to push you a little bit or, 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 or point you, I guess, because you are someone in the deer hunting world. Now that you are the NDA Deer Manager of the Year, uh, you, you have... You have oh, now man. the authority. A lot of pressure. Yeah, you have the you now have the authority and the title to speak to <laughs> to speak to um a little bit of how unique your own personal menu has been compared to some others in the deer hunting world. And this is something that I think, you know, Steve's giving you an opportunity to talk about. So people I think are well aware of the fact that you manage your property a little bit differently than the typical property we're gonna see on the outdoor channel or something like that, right? You have gone to great lengths over the years to manage the Duran family farm in a more holistic way with a more of an ecosystem focus versus just a make big deer focus. And that's kind of where I, where I want to spend a little more time here because we've, we've talked around the edges of this over the years, but we've never really dove, dove deep into it. So I'm curious first, what was the impetus for that? with you like how did that philosophy get into get under your skin and become the way you want to do this because i know like you had a a journey when it came to like really focusing on big giant bucks and then you've you've kind of traveled along a a slightly different route over the years but but also when it comes to just like how you worked with the land was that from Mm -hmm. an early age or early in your management kind of journey that hey i want to do this a different kind of way or at first were you just thinking man i want big deer and this is how we're going to do it. Um, can you just give me a little insight into like how this came to be where we are? Sure. So, you know, you know the the, the long story about the farm being in the family for so long. Um, we're in our 121st year now, um, uh, and it was it was never about. This wasn't a property that was ever that the, the, the primary reason for it was to have for hunting. My great grandparents bought this property for the timber and they were, they had a sawmill and um, they managed the woods. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know. I can't, I can't say, Oh, and here's how they managed it. Exactly. I can tell you what the results were. I don't know what their intentions were at the time because it was 120 years ago. I never met those people. Um, but I can tell you that I cut my great grandfather's trees a few years ago, right? right? Because it was there. Some of those trees were it was their time to go. Um, I did speak with my grandfather a lot, uh, a bit about it. He died when I was eighteen, and he also had sawmills. So it was first and foremost a place that was producing timber for sawmill production, and then this farm, you know, quintessential Wisconsin dairy farm, you know, the red barn, the white house, the white milk house, it looks like the Wisconsin license plate, yeah. was carved out of it. Um, and of the 400 acres, you know, 100 acres tillable, 60 acres of pasture, 240 acres of woods. Um, so from that perspective, when I was a kid, we, it was a farm and we went out to the farm to work. I, I grew up in town two miles away. You know, I didn't, didn't grow up in this house. Um, and so hunting was something, I was squirrel and rabbit hunting and that kind of stuff. I mean, this is, a, you know, the early 1970s. And, you know, my buddies and I went squirrel hunting and rabbit hunting and stuff. But when you came time to go deer hunting, we actually went up north. 
which is a whole nother. We could have a whole discussion yeah. about what's going on up in northern Wisconsin right now. But we went up north a few years because that's what my dad did, you know, after World War II, because that's where the deer were. Right. And um, so it wasn't really a consideration. But by then, by the time in the, um, I guess the first year I deer hunted was 1971. Boy, does that make me feel old. But um, uh, by the mid, by the time I was getting through high school, we were deer hunting around here because, gee, there were deer around. Um, but it was never about, oh, when we're going deer hunting. You know, like, or, or, and we're going deer hunting for big giant bucks. You just went out and you had an antler, you had one buck tag. And in those days, four people had to apply to get, to maybe get a doe tag. That's how few deer there were. Right. And what they were, what they, the Department of Natural Resources were trying to do. So it was, it was about farming. You know, if I always say it's a, it was a yardstick and still to this day, it may seem a little different now, but you know, if, if, if the farm is a yardstick, hunting was, in those days, maybe three or four inches. Now, now it's maybe a foot, you know, but it's still about these other things. Specifically about deer hunting, though, when my younger brother, Matthew, um, my late brother, Matthew, uh, coming up on, uh, or just passed, I'm sorry, his the 28th anniversary of, of his death, um, he was, he was, he was into it. The rest of us kind of left the area, and Matt was the one. He was the youngest of all of us, and he said, yeah, I'm going to stay around here. He became an electrician, and he lived here in the farmhouse, and um, and he was a bow hunter. I like him. And uh, <laughs> I know you, you'd have got along great <laughs> with him. Ironically enough, he's exactly right now. He would have been exactly Steve's age. Hmm. Um, and... Uh, but he also gun hunted and he fished and they small game hunted all of that. And, and he's really the first one who said to me, you know what? We got to let some of these little bucks go <laughs> and, and see what happens. And, you know, that was 35 years ago. And so that kind of stuff was happening. I remember, oh, there was some noise about, but I mean, a big giant buck in those days was, you know, a two-year-old. <laughs> um, well, and so, changed. yeah, times have changed quite a bit. And um, and we certainly had the potential for all that. And every once in a while, some big old hog would get killed, and it would just be like, where did that thing come from? Yeah. Would well, you get that up north? And, oh, no, I got it, you know, down in Hawkins Creek or something. And people just were, were surprised by that. Um, and so all of that, you know, has evolved. That evolved, and, and Matt sort of got me thinking about it. And... Um, we had agreed that we were going to start doing that. And then unfortunately he died in a car accident right down here on the highway. And uh, I sort of took that idea and um, you always get a little emotional when you start thinking about him and talking about him, especially, uh, especially this time of the year. But um, took that idea. He said one time when I killed this deer that um, that was the best buck I killed my life up to that time. And he goes, oh, yeah, but he'd have been a nice buck next year. And, uh, and I'm like, what do you mean? And uh, th that was his point, right? It's like, you know, like the deer that you see behind me, they didn't even have that kind of thing around here then. And uh, so that's kind of what got us going and sort of in his memory, maybe even his honor, you know, that we started doing a little more of that. And I got a little wrapped up in the idea of let him go so he can grow. And uh and then our neighbor killed on ag tags, killed like 24 antlerless deer one winter. And the next year it was like <laughs> bucks. You get home and I like to think I pay attention. And I looked at that and went, well, that's pretty cool. We need to kill more antlerless deer. And so that was 25 years ago. And we started killing more antlerless deer. From a habitat perspective, we were just managing our forests or our woods in a managed forest kind of way you know we were doing it was a productive forest kind of way and boy i learned pretty quickly that if you're doing good forest management you're probably doing good habitat management as well you know that you're you you're creating edge and you're getting younger successional forests and gee why isn't why aren't those we don't see as many deer hanging out in those big trees most of the year except for that time when the you know, like the white oaks start dropping their acorns and then they're in there like crazy, yeah. you know. Um, and you just, all of that kind of stuff starts happening. So, you know, you think about that. And, I mean, ultimately, we were, we were managing this property 
sort of in the traditional way of of my great grandparents and grandparents and and then what, what the things that my dad taught me and then we started getting foresters involved because i you know I, I mean i have a bit of a conservation background and horticulture background but it's like i learned a long time ago that um you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room you need to find the smartest guy in the room right yeah. or the smartest guy about a, or a smart person about that subject and i've worked with a whole lot of different foresters out here now um and biologists and you know i'm always you know looking for that so we did the let him go so he can grow kind of thing for a while and killed more more does and then you know 22 years ago now cwd showed up 60 miles to the south of us and we were immediately in the um cwd management zone or the herd reduction zone is what they actually called it. and it kind of made sense to me from an animal husbandry standpoint right that you uh that that if you have a bunch of animals crowded together they're more apt to get if there's a disease they're more apt to spread it around um so that was it, it sort of made sense to me and it also gee when we were killing more deer um, especially our antlerless deer, we're getting bigger bucks. So all these things were going together. We're doing this forestry work. And um, I started putting food plots in, thinking that was cool. And uh, being a farm kid, you know, I got a tractor, I got a disc, I got a seed planter, I've got all this stuff. And um, it was interesting to do that. But then I ended up sort of seeing the, the I don't know, the folly in it, but sort of the it wasn't multidimensional enough, right? I mean, you and I have we have this joke, of course, and I always say food plots in farm country are like taking sand to the beach. And it is a little bit like that. I mean, I can go out for a drive this evening this, after we're done, and I'll see 100 deer on a drive, and they're going to be just out on fields. Um, so why would I go out and put more of that in? What is it that they, what is it that they, they need, and what can I do for the, whole, the entire um, biotic community? And, you know, I was read Leopold when I was in high school and certainly was influenced by him then. And um, as I've gotten older, it's one thing I'll, I'll warn you about, is as you get older, you become more philosophical. And when we were doing the uh, let him go so he can grow management here, the nice buck next year management we, we talked you know, talk about, um, I didn't, it was pretty loose. I mean, you had to wear a sombrero if you shot too small of a buck, you know. It wasn't like, oh, this was like we were fighting people or yelling at people or anything like that. And when it was younger hunters and when it was um, newer hunters and that kind of stuff, it's like, go ahead and shoot a deer that you're going to be happy with. Let's get some deer under your belt. And my nephews and my daughter, you know, all of that was happening. Uh, and then I had a kind of an incident with a family friend who you know, made a really egregious area, shot a real tiny buck 50 yards from him. And, you know, I kind of barked at him about it and he felt bad about it. And I felt bad about it. And I was like, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to manage people or have people wondering if that's going to be big enough. Brittany Brothers, who we, was on an episode that we filmed here, apologized for shooting. And she had full permission. She never shot a deer before. And she goes, I'm sorry, I shot a little one. And I'm like, okay, I, don't, I never want to hear that again. So, I'm not saying that you have to shoot the first buck that comes by, but you can shoot the first buck that comes by if you want to, like you did. You shot the first buck that came by. When you were I guess it happened to be. Well, <laughs> I suppose that's true. The first buck I had, in, <laughs> the first buck I had in shooting range was was a shooter. Um, but I, but I want to I want to clarify something, which is you you had this trajectory. You had like a a deer management trajectory and a habitat management path like there's these two parallel things right and your your deer management decisions have changed right as, as you went from you guys are shooting anything to then let them go let them grow and now more recently that's changed because of cwd and you know getting more folks involved but but the habitat side of things and let them go let them grow what am i trying to say here managing for what's right for the landscape or what's right for the larger ecosystem or what's right for the the forest, what's right by what Leopold might say, like that does not have to be mutually exclusive from somebody wanting to practice, let them go, let them grow. I want better deer hunting too, right? I think when I look at what you have there, 
I think what I'm getting at here is when I look at your situation, you are someone who's said that I want to manage my landscape for the health of the ecosystem, not just big deer, but the product of you managing your landscape for the health of the ecosystem is that you do have great deer hunting and you do have big giant bucks. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that those things, it doesn't have to be an either or decision for someone listening. It can be a yes and type situation, right? I think you are living proof of that. You're exactly right. And, and uh, living proof is, you know, I guess that's one of the things that the benefit of, of time and age really is. Um, I talk to uh, folks all the time who ask me about sort of shortening the learning curve on, you know, on, on improving their property. And my question is, is, who do you want to improve it for? And they're like, well, for deer. And I'm like, well, you know, for the most part, deer are going to live real well around here no matter what. I mean, this, and this is, you know, this bigger southwest Wisconsin area. But you're exactly right. Those things are not mutually exclusive. We can do, we can do what's best for the biotic community as a whole. You know, Leopold said that whole thing about um, a, a thing is right when it. I actually wrote it down. It, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty, which I thought was an interesting word for him to have in there. The beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So what's the biotic community, right? It's not deer. It's not turkeys alone it's right. all of these other things yeah. but like i said about forest management like managing our woods well gee uh one of the smartest foresters that i've worked with um who's not even a deer hunter um asked me after we did some work well you know how's, it, how's this affecting your deer hunting and i said well, it seems to be better and he goes yeah isn't that interesting Good forest management is good deer habitat management. And then, again, just making a vague reference to what's going on in northern Wisconsin, part of what the habitat, part of one of the issues they have up there is a habitat issue. Yeah, It's just, it's a degraded habitat and, you know, maybe some overmature timber. But when you look at a piece of property like ours, and you, you and I didn't get, we've spent a little time out here, but, you know, we've got some brand new woods starting over um, where we did the shelterwood harvest. and. You know, 100 years from now, by God, there's going to be big oak trees up there again. And the next, whatever, how many generations that is from now, they're going to be cutting great grandpa's trees too. And only this time it'll be Doug will be great grandpa, right? Um, and then we have areas that we, you know, we're just letting it go. Sort of a legacy area. There's big old giant oaks in there. And we're in this wonderful position because of that 240 acres, 11 different stands of timber where we can do that. And I don't take that lightly, but every decision I make about the management of this property is done thoughtfully and with the advice and help of experts. And then it all gets held up to the mirror of it's not ours, it's just our turn. That we're, we're doing, we're planning and implementing today something that's honoring the past and doing the best we can for the future, for the present and the future. And I think philosophically, that's working. I know philosophically it's working really well for us. And I think that that was what Leopold was getting at. I mean, yeah. I'm just stealing all this stuff from Leopold. Um, you know, the land ethic, that idea that, and I've been there uh, with the land ethic. The reason he evolved into that and he died when he was younger than, than me, he was 62, um, he had evolved, and he talks about that in the Sand County Almanac, about this isn't, this is, the land ethic is something that he came to over time. And I think that the lesson of Leopold is maybe we can get that land ethics, we can, rather than it being the, the result of a lifetime, that those lessons can be learned, uh, or that, and even the lessons need to be learned over time, I guess. But philosophically, you can develop a philosophy pretty early on. And it's been really gratifying that it's not ours, just our turn has been, has resonated with people because it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's, okay, it, it makes sense to me. Um, and so is this a good thing to do for now in the future? Um, man, I've done plenty of things in my life, not just on this farm, but that all seemed like a good idea at the time. And uh, maybe they didn't work out that well. And, and we've certainly had some of that in conservation as well. Um, it's really interesting when you start to read Leopold's notes 
um, I, on vacation, I was reading a, a, a collection of essays that hadn't really been published. Most of it hadn't been published before that. And, uh, you know, he was really into upland game birds, and which was kind of interesting because it was like pheasants. Um, you know, there's the natives, of course, but pheasants are an exotic, but he liked hunting pheasants. And the cool thing about that was, is that the habitat that he was concerned about and was creating was for more than that one particular species. And that's what I find to be really interesting, that if you can work on a uh, property and, and do conservation on a property that is thoughtful and looking forward, doing the best we can now for the future, um, learning from the past, um, that you, the, the diversity that can happen um, has a lot more impact than managing for one particular species. And, and it's not even just because it's the right thing to do, but it's also, it practically leads to better results too. So by that, I mean like, like everything in the ecosystem is connected, right? So right. what you do impacts the bugs, which impacts the birds, which impacts the plants, which impacts the deer. And what you do with the deer impacts the vegetation, which impacts the small mammals, which it, it, every little, you know, was, I think it was Muir who said that you pull one thread in the world and, and everything else is connected. And, yeah. and so I think that it's having that kind of multi-species or, or bigger picture set of goals, like managing for the community, not the individual, it leads to better results for your deer hunting or, or whatever it is you're focused on, your pheasants, whatever. And I think there's this, this opportunity though, because people listening to this podcast want quality deer hunting, right? That's, that's what I've always wanted. And so I've always looked at, well, what, what can you do to get better deer hunting? And so often what we realize though, you brought this up earlier, is that our deer situation, most cases is like the least of our problems in the area, right? Deer do pretty darn well in a lot of habitat types around today. They are incredible survivors. They're overpopulated in many places. Um, mm -hmm. But all around them, are all these other animals, all these different insects, birds, game birds, songbirds, you name it, um, amphibians, all sorts of other critters that are like rapidly disappearing. Population declines 50, 60, 70, 80%. Even common critters around me and I mean around you, like we are, everything around deer are kind of in crisis mode, unbeknownst mm -hmm. to a lot of us. And then deer are just kind of standing there as the bathtub is are draining around them. Yeah. And so, I, I'm increasingly realizing that if we, as folks who care so much about deer, if we don't plug the hole in that bathtub, because the whole thing is falling down around deer, eventually it will impact deer and the thing that we first and foremost care about or, or brought us to this table. And so it would behoove us to start doing some things to help the rest of that system to keep the thing that we originally loved around too. And I think we've got like a, a huge opportunity to do that. Um, and it's not, it's not just altruistic. It's also self-serving. Like if you want to enjoy the thing you love, we probably have to look beyond just how do we grow bigger deer or how do I get the best food plot or the best tree stand location, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, that's been the interesting thing to me about all of this. You know, it's like the, the, the accolade, like the deer manager thing. Uh, trying to do the right thing for the entire community, biotic community, ends up being the right thing and best thing for the thing that we are most, in the case of people who are most interested in deer hunting, yep. that. So then what happens? And then what happens when that thing that you uh, are most desirous of, deer, becomes a detriment to the rest of the biotic community. And that's what we have in Southwest Wisconsin. Right. And it's becoming a detriment to itself. And this is where I get into arguments with people or people take offense at some of the things that I, not you know, but other people, uh, you know, offense. Why do you want to kill all deer? I don't want to kill all the deer. You know what I want is I want healthy deer. I want a smaller population. I want a healthy population and I want a healthy ecosystem. Those things can all happen at the same time. But here's what we need to do to do it. Unfortunately, 
there's a lot of discussion these days about ballot box biology, you know, like out west or up uh, out west, I guess, with the hunting wolves, wolves lions, all that stuff, yeah. lions, all that stuff. And then in northern Wisconsin, people just want to kill wolves. I think wolves are cool. I think they belong on the landscape. I think we need to manage them. And I think it's really unfortunate that we're not getting to manage them. But one of the things that I've noticed is that about and about a lot of folks, but uh, particularly about deer hunters, is that they want to project more than they want to go, what, what, what is it that I can do better? Um, looking in the mirror is kind of a tough thing. I had this conversation with the, a neighbor about, you know, it's just not like it used to be. You know, I've been hunting on that same stump for 20 years, and I'm like, you got to move stumps, man. Um, but it's, you know, that they're not if they're not evolving and he thinks it's well it's because this or that is happening and it's like there's all of these things that are happening happening around you but the one thing that you can really impact is what your behavior is um it didn't that doesn't work anymore let's do that it used to go like that now it goes like this you know um that that is really one of the things but people calling for science-based management you know of wolves of bears of cougars whatever what about science-based management of deer if we were following science-based management white-tailed deer in southwest wisconsin we would have still have earned buck we'd have uh, uh I, I would think that we would have an earlier gun season we, we don't start deer hunting until the week before the saturday before thanksgiving um and the reasons for that are they're political um, right now, we've got politicians want to be involved with uh, the deer hunting up north, and we're going to. They want to outlaw killing does for the next four years. And the biologists are all like, "That's that's not that's not the problem. If the if the problem is, I'm not seeing the problem. You know, and then you have these the politicians have these public hearings, and people are hollering about the deer hunting is no good anymore. It's like, well." what are all the reasons for that and what they look at is wolves or we're killing too many does or you know and rather than one specific thing there's all these it's it's multi-layered and that's where the scientists where the biologists come in i was talking to a dear friend of mine who's a uh dnr wildlife biologist yesterday and uh one of the interesting things that he has said to me in the past he didn't say it yesterday but one of the things that he said was you know it's really hard being a deer biologist because I thought that our job was to manage the resource for the benefit of the people of Wisconsin. It seems like because of the way the system has worked and the politics and, and whatnot that are involved is that what we're really managing or being allowed to manage because of the laws that have been changed is just the deer hunting experience. And people don't seem to think we're doing a very good job of that. I'm like, I don't know, man. I think you're doing a hell of a job of it. Part of that is because we're looking in the, in the mirror and, and here and doing it. You know, we've had an incredibly successful year um, this past year. And we've had, you know, in terms of just numbers of deer killed, killed 47 deer on this 600 acres this, this past season. So 600 acres is less than a square mile. And this certainly is an all habitat, but, and, and people will say to me, I can't believe that you think there's 65 deer per square mile of habitat in this county. And I was like, I think there's more because that's, I mean, that's kind of the number that gets bantied about, right? And I said, I actually think there's more because over the past five years now, we've averaged almost 40 deer a season that we've killed. So two thirds of the deer. And I've got trail cameras out right now. Um, and we'll fly a drone and whatnot. And those numbers are still way up there. Yeah. Part of it is, of course, that neighbors are not, there's, there's a, you know, a bunch of different variables in it. And a big part of it is, is quite honestly, 600 acres is freaking deer habitat. Yeah, great habitat. So they might be going out and in the wintertime and spending time in those, you know, those fields and stuff, but they are living here. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not taking sand to the beach. I'm not putting food plots in. I'm doing habitat improvements. Um, sure, I'm overseeding trails with with you know, with uh, clover and doing those sort of things, but we're 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 doing it on on a high level, and then we're also really taking that 
deer herd down. And look what we did this year. Uh, you got a four-year-old. Uh, Cal got a five-year-old. We got three. No, we had four three-year-olds. We killed some younger bucks also. I still got really nice deer on camera. I mean, like, I didn't send them to you because you might have been, hey, you know, a little late season hunting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually did welcome a couple of, of, of my uh, cooperators to come in uh, late season hunt. They never got a, a shot. Um, tomorrow, I think, is the last day. But um, but they saw some of those deer. Um, my neighbor shot a five-year-old buck that, unfortunately, that I had on camera a bunch of times. Unfortunately, it was CWD positive, and he was starting to show the signs. My other neighbor got a five- or six-year-old buck. He doesn't test, so we don't know, but that deer was definitely in decline. His antlers the year before, I think I even sent you a picture. Big giant buck, big drop tine on him. Cal and I saw him the night before opening day, and then uh, then the neighbor shot him the next morning. And um, see, in the other way, there was another one. So really, you start to take these overlapping areas here, and we're killing a half a dozen big mature deer, and there's still some left. And the guys over at the Duran farm are we're just laying them down. Um, and I've got some other neighbors now that are doing the same thing. You know, I mean, when I say neighbors, they're not necessarily touching us, but, you know, a half a mile away, property another half a mile away. Um, we're not going to run out of white-tailed deer from killing them with, with guns and bows or cars. But um, the impact that, that the disease is having is, is concerning. Yeah. So, again, it's sort of balancing all that stuff. You, you you keep on bringing up the food plots thing, um, bringing sand <laughs> to the beach, right? Um, so I gotta I gotta do my pushback on that to you and, and see if no, finally you're rising to the bait. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna bite. <laughs> I'm gonna bite. So so you and me had this debate when I was down there visiting, and I understand your take. Your take is that there's food all over the place, so why are you putting more food out there, right? And my rebuttal to that was twofold. It was one part, which was, well, yes, but with a food plot, you can be more strategic with it in ways that can help you actually shooting deer, you know, hunting, putting the plots where you want them, better positioning or designing the food plot to give you a better shot opportunity with a bow. You can plant something that's unique compared to what's on all the farm fields around you. So you can be the ice cream shop in the in the neighborhood and draw deer and because of that etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's all these hunting things and you kind of rolled your eyes and said yeah whatever um you weren't impressed with that <laughs> i stand by it for folk for folks who I, no, I, i'm with you yeah, okay. for folks for folks who especially bow hunting you know want to increase their opportunities there's there's a reason there um but i think my best argument which i'm curious if you have done some more thinking and, and, and i think i'm wrong on this but my best rebuttal to you on this is that I think that food plots are a great entryway. They're a great entry drug, you could say, into the conservation wildlife habitat world in that they are usually the first thing that a deer hunter tries when they're thinking about trying to improve habitat because it's the sexiest thing, because it seems to be the thing that is most, um, you know, could be the most impactful. So it's, it's a thing that everybody talks about and everyone sees like, oh, wow, so-and-so has food plots and they kill deer. And so I'm going to try it. And so my argument is that that is not a bad thing. That is a good thing and that people see a food plot on TV and they say, oh, I want to try that because it might make my deer hunting better. I say all that because if that person goes and buys a buck on the bag, food plot seed, whatever it is, and they plan a little food plot, I recognize that is not the end all be all of improving wildlife habitat or helping your deer population. But I think it's a really good way for people to dip their toe in the water. And then all of a sudden realize like, Oh wow, I did this food plot thing. And I learned that I have to pay attention to soil quality. Hmm. What new rabbit hole might that take me down? Or, Hmm, I'm doing this food plot thing. And all of a sudden I'm realizing like I'm, I'm spraying this roundup stuff. How does this kill everything? What does this do? And maybe you read an article about it and then you realize like, Oh, yikes, there's this thing called spray drift and it's killing all the milkweed around here. And that's why I don't see butterflies anymore. Or maybe you do this food plot thing and you realize like, Oh, wow. When I cleared out this little patch of forest to get the food plot in, not only are the deer feeding on the 
a little clover patch I planted, but actually there's a 10 yard strip of just weeds and stuff that are growing around it. And there's all these flowers in there now. And now there's all these bugs in there and the deer feed on that too. So maybe there's something to this like early successional habitat. And maybe I should read more about this. And if that person who at first was just interested in planting a food plot to kill more deer, if you give that person the opportunity to do that, not all, but many people I think end up in their own little way, having conversations with themselves or their hunting buddies or their family, kind of like what we're having here today in which they realize there's more to it. And if you have that opportunity to start realizing that there's more to it, then you have an opportunity for more people to start thinking about managing their timber, for more people to start thinking about early successional habitat. There's more opportunity for people to maybe think about, hey, man, not only can I improve this place for deer, but I could also make it better for the birds and the bugs and the water quality. And none of that happens on my mind unless that person, I'm not saying this is the only entryway, but I think it is one common entryway into that world. So that is my argument to you, Mr. Doug Duran, for why food plots aren't so bad. What do you say? Well, one, I'm not saying that they're bad. What I'm saying is, uh, or my response to that is that you're saying that it's introduction to conservation, and it sounds to me like it's an introduction to farming because that's what they're doing, right? I mean, or gardening. I mean, it's what you're doing. You're putting in a, a little garden for the deer. So that's something. And it's, you know, it's very, it's very specific. So rather than an introduction to conservation, it's it's an introduction to farming. If you're going to introduce somebody to conservation, let's introduce them to conservation. And it's, um, it's not, if you're going to put that energy in, let's put that energy into uh, simple habitat improvements, uh, feather edging. Uh, and I'm not saying you can't do a food plot or that it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that I think that it's, it's, it's over-focused on. Um, and the other part of that is, what kind of a food plot? And if you are going out and you're tilling it up every year and you're spraying it and you're doing the, I mean, all of that, right? I mean, because you know, when you do, you you watch a food plot video or go to a food plot seminar, they're talking about, um, they're talking about spraying, they're talking about pH of the soil, they're talking about fertilizing, they're, doing, they're talking about farming. And I'm a farmer, you know, or at least I was. Um, that's what that is. That's farming. But at the same time, I do, I work with a, do some work with a seed company, one of our sponsors, Hoxie Native Seeds. And before I started working with those guys, I went on their website. And, I, you know, it's kind of seed stuff that they have because in Hoxie Native Seeds. And then I saw food plots and I went, uh, okay, I guess I'm going to have to take a look at what they're recommending for food plots. And maybe they're in the brassica business or corn and beans business too. Um. And I went on there, and their food plots were 100% native, 100% perennial, um, and they were formulated for different species. I was like, that's a food plot I can get behind. Um, I have giant food plots out here. It's called CRP. Um, I have prairie strips in there, and those prairie strips are not providing corner beans. They can get, and, and, and they're not GMO corner beans either. Um, which is what most food plot corn and beans are, right? It's Roundup ready, and they're spraying Roundup on it. Um, I've had many discussions with with guys about food plots who, you know, they're like, my food plot's kind of dirty. I'm like, so what? Yeah. You know, so what? It's like, oh, I was thinking about going, it's Roundup ready. So I thought maybe I'd go in and spray it again. And I'm like, no, that's what I mean. It's an introduction into farming. And man, I like sometimes I feel like I'm, that guy at the AA meeting, like, yeah, I used to be way into big giant bucks and I used to be way into food plots. Well, I guess I'm still into both of those things, but I've just evolved, you know, over time. And I, and, and, and I just, I, I, and maybe everybody's got to evolve and maybe I'm just like trying to, you know, push people along to learn things faster than I did. Um, that let's worry about the habitat. Let's worry about if you want to do something rather than keeping that in CRP or, or in field, put it in uh, CRP and have a nice mixture in there that's going to be providing 
food and habitat to more than just white-tailed deer and or wild turkeys. Yeah. Um, as soon as we're getting, now we, we had a bunch of snow here, but now it's clearing off. And I'll look on the side hill over here tonight. Um, where our CRP is, and there's a bunch of Forbes in there. There are deer out there scratching in that stuff. They're scratching it just like they will in a in a cornfield or a bean field for the leftover grain. So it's this. So we're uh, we're we're accomplishing the same things without yearly inputs, you know, and all of that. And you've actually talked about that. Well, hell, when we were doing the back 40, you talked about that. So you don't disagree with me about this stuff. <laughs> um, I, I just, I would, I would rather see people, or I was, I, maybe even rather is the wrong word. Maybe I would just challenge them because I don't want to run somebody down from putting in, you know, food plot because I don't disagree with what you're saying, Mark. I, I, I do disagree though. Who am I kidding? But I'm, um, but it's like my buddy Chip, you know, Chip, he met mm -hmm. Chip. He goes, what do you think I ought to do down here? You know, he's on this, and he's had the, uh, the deer management assistant program biologist come in and talk with him. And he's like, well, I was thinking about doing a food plot. And the guy's kind of like, it's all one big food plot you got here already. It's a hay field. Why don't you, uh, let's think about seeding into it. Well, but, structure and they started talking about this guy's chip started talking about switchgrass and all that stuff for you know for borders and protection and all of that i was like it seems like you plant some trees or some native shrubs and that sort of thing would be a good thing too i think for almost every annual food plot kind of thing you're going to find something that's perennial that's going to do as good that's native that's going to do as good a job or semi-native even you know like apple trees and stuff and they're going, to, they're going to provide what it is that you're looking for, and you're not going to have those constant, you know, inputs. Yeah. I think the trick, I think the trick to a lot of this is is, re, is realizing that for people to, for most folks, most of us, you and I in many cases, right, for us to, to, for us to put time, energy, money, whatever it is, into a thing, into a project, into a property, it, it still has to satisfy like our, our initial needs or wants out of it, like our, our selfish desires, which like, you have to look at the, like the simple base incentives. And for a lot of us, for a lot of folks still, it begins with like, I want to kill deer. I want to kill a big deer. And it might stay that way for a long, for a long while. I think the trick is finding ways in which we can satisfy that base desire, like that initial desire while also expanding beyond that to satisfy the rest realizing that when we satisfy the rest it comes back around and helps with that initial desire too there's some people who don't need that initial thing who just want to do the right thing for the ecosystem and that's enough satisfaction but but fair like it's it's not no shame on anyone else who also like hey i'm spending all this money because i really like big deer and the rest of it's great too and i want to help it but i still really want my big deer that's okay too and so i think the idea that I want to keep hammering is like both are possible, but to your point, don't just get stuck in the original thing. It's a much larger universe. Explore those other things. There are better ways. There's always a better way. And if we can continue moving down that path towards a better way, it will help with the original thing. Um, that's like my, that's like my thesis coming out of this. And that I think is, is where, more attention to your point more attention needs to be focused on that stuff because there's a lot of people talking about the obvious stuff not as many people are talking about that next step yeah and that's that's why i like to spend time with ecologists um you know why i'm a big supporter of pheasants forever i'll be at pheasant fest coming up uh the first weekend in march um out in sioux falls uh, and i'll be speaking actually five times Get my pitches in here now, um, and uh, the part of what we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about is this, right? I'm not going to be balling people off for doing food plots, <laughs> but what's really interesting to me is how even that, you know, the, that Pheasants Forever, as the, the who started the Farm Bill Biologist Program, right? They pay for you know, a portion of those salaries, and and all of that that happens, and we have Farm Bill programs that are focusing on doing the best thing for the land. Um, last year, I spoke at a, a landowner and operator uh, forum, and it was about essentially getting those people to talk. And one of the things that 
another presenter talked about was Red Acres, Green Acres. And so Green Acres are the, is the best land, right? Is the land that's going to be the most highly productive. Let's farm that. Let's not farm those red acres. So you might see a field and, you know, you saw how the fields are around here, right? Where they kind of go in and out of these hillsides yeah. and into these wood edges and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you're losing the first 25 feet to shade and to deer and to, you know, whatever, you know, to wildlife. Well, rather than that being another 25 feet of corner beans, let's put that into 25 feet of CRP or 30 feet of CRP, that's a perennial cover. That's a better filter for runoff. That's a, that's a, for carbon sequestering. We're not ripping that soil up every year. Um, and really interesting talking to a couple of guys who were doing that. And they were actually, um, well, they're outfitters and, and they were leasing land from farm, their farmer outfitters. So they were um, uh, commodity farmers. And so they had their own farm, but then they were also leasing land from other other farmers. And they were showing them what they were doing on their property. They said, we will pay you whatever the rate is for the whole thing, you know, for all the X amount of acres that you guys are currently being paid for. But what we'd like to do is take the red acres and not put those inputs into that area, put that into CRP. And if the CRP payment is less than what the base rental payment is, we'll make up the difference. So you get the CR payment and we'll say if it's 175 and then we'll pay you the other 25 yeah. if it's $200 an acre for everything else. And we'll put that in and we're not putting our inputs into marginal land then. We're, get, we're putting, you know, we're focusing on the best land and then we're creating that habitat. And then as Upland, uh, I think they were also doing uh, deer, uh, deer uh, outfitting. Um, they were creating better habitat for not only the animals that they were, uh, that, that was a part of their operation, but for everything. I was like, and these guys were young bucks like you. And I'm like, holy moly, you guys are killing it. I mean, just from a thought process, yeah. right? I'm, and, 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 you know, here I'm 65 and what are you like 27 now or something like 36, that? I think, Doug. <laughs> 36. <laughs> um, uh, I just wasn't that far along in any of this as you are and those guys were. So, um, so I think that's great. You know, I think, I think that's kind of, that's great. I also wasn't, um, I've always been kind of a casual hunter. Um, you know, 99% of the hunting that I've done in my life is right out here. Um, you know, a couple of, couple of trips that, you know, end up on television and, Kind of looks like, well, you do that stuff all the time. <laughs> no, I did it once. <laughs> you know, it was a heck um, of a trip, though. And it was a heck of a trip. Um, you know, and so it, it's never, it's never, it was never my primary focus to begin with. Right. I mean, I like killing big giant bucks. You know, there's a few on the wall back mm -hmm. there, including that big fella right there. Yeah. And um, pretty uh, good for a casual hunter, Doug. <laughs> yeah, pretty good for. But you know, <laughs> it's so funny about that. I meant to bring that up earlier. Yeah, we'll just leave that. Here, I'll shift over a little bit. Um, I meant to bring that up earlier where we were talking to go all the way back to the beginning of what we talked about. That's exactly how I, what you and I did that day when you, and you ended up killing that buck that's back over here on the, on the table. I should probably now you gotta turn, now you gotta turn the camera again so they can see my beautiful deer back there, Doug. <laughs> I'll just pull it up here. Um, Try not to break its nose off. Here's your here's your big giant buck. Oh man, look at that! I got to figure yeah. out a way to get back up there and grab that thing soon. Yeah, there's that hole in it. And everything uh -huh. that we. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's sitting right over there with cows. You know, cow mm -hmm. killed a really nice one too. Yeah. Um, but I did the same thing with that buck with 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 the standard, which this is smaller than I might add if we were going to compare. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> By several um, orders of magnitude. But I did the same thing with that. You know, there was an area back there that I had spent this time in. I saw this deer. I figured him out. I, I, I went back to where the tractor and was brush hogging the edges like I always did. Left the tractor running and the thing is, and I ran over and strapped a, a climber to this elm tree that wasn't really big enough to hold me. And two weeks later, I crawled up in that thing. That deer walked up the same spot, and that's where I killed it. Yeah. It was just the same Oh, and, and there was an apple tree there too, I might add. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was the end of October. And in those days, we could hunt at the end of October with a uh, rifle. So, 
Um, I shot him at 35 yards <laughs> with a rifle. Kind of felt bad about it. I was like, man, I could have killed him with a yeah, bow. Yeah, could have been the bow. Um, uh, but then I probably just wounded him. But um, it's um, that all of that is, you know, I get excited about it. I'm, I'm real interested in it. But the thing that I'm real, uh, the thing that I like most about all of this is how much fun it is, first of all, um, how interesting it is and how it's just a part of conservation. Like I said, I went back to that yardstick thing, right, of mm-hmm. the farm, that if the farm's a yardstick, it used to be three or four inches. Hunting was something we got to do when we got the chores done. That's why we were never bow hunters when I was a kid. You just, I mean, I was not going to be sitting in a tree the first part of our tour. We were picking corn yeah. and stuff here. I have time for that. And um, one of these days, I may get back out there with a bow. Um, you've kind of inspired yeah, me. Yeah, I'm going to keep way. pushing you. Yeah. Well, it'll be a crossbow, but um, okay. yeah. Uh, so, so I want to. But I wanna, it's all a part of it. Yeah. yeah. So, I want to assume, let's assume that there is at least one person listening to this who's heard what you have to say and what I have to say and who thinks to themselves, huh, you know, I've been dabbling with the food plots. I've been dabbling with deer habitat improvement been trying to get better hunting. Some of these things that Mark and Doug have said make some sense. There's probably value in expanding my horizons of what I'm looking at here. And maybe I can start trying to do some things that help the larger biotic community as leopold put it right you know i I don't i don't know where i heard this first i think it might have been my friend craig doherty but i heard this idea of leopold landscapes Mm. and and that being like a land a a property an area a landscape managed in this kind of way that we're talking about with a little bit more of a holistic focus with a with an eye on doing what's right for the whole ecosystem for the biotic community so this idea if someone's listening and thinks to themselves yeah you know what i want to try to shift my little back 40 into more of a Leopold landscape. What would be the guidelines or what would be a handful of, of principles or guidelines to think about as someone embarks on that project, either from your perspective, Doug, or what you think Leopold would say if we wanted to, if we wanted to look back at the original OG of this idea. Um, what do you think some of those things would be that, that we could think about? One of the first things I encourage any landowner to do is to engage with their um, local conservation departments. And, and remember, I'm, I spent a lot of time in Wisconsin, but as I've expanded my um, – people have contacted me from all over the country. Um, about land management, one of the things that the number one thing I say is take advantage of as as many resources that are available to you as possible. Um, Of course, I'll tell them to read, you know, Sam County Almanac or, excuse me, some of these other uh, writings of Leopold, but engaging with a local land conservation department, like we have in Wisconsin, we have them on the county level. Most, you know, and most of the folks that we engage with um, white-tailed deer hunters in the in the Midwest and the East, almost every state has a Department of Natural Resources, and they'll have like a forestry department. Almost every state has a, uh, a natural resource conservation service, and there, those are the farm. That's where the farm bill biologists are. Um, I think it's really important to 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 engage with those people. But be, and, and don't be intimidated by them. Their job, I mean, in a lot of their, this is free services to you. I mean, it's your tax dollars at work. Is that they'll come out and they'll spend some time with you learning about that. But I also think it's important that you can meet, try to meet people that are, are, are like-minded, you know, um, engage with, with the National Deer Association chapters. Um, engage with Pheasants Forever chapters. Um, Woodland owner chapters. I mean, if you're a landowner, you should be involved. Those, those are things that you should at least have a cursory knowledge of, and then and then you kind of go, yeah, I like the idea. That I don't like the idea. Uh, I don't like the idea of that. But some of the the I one of the things that I tell people who contact me about land management consulting, is, or I ask them, is um, to talk, think about what their goals and objectives are. You know, they might say, oh, "I want big giant bucks." And then my question usually is, and is there anything else? Or why did you buy the property? 
The other thing is to get yourself a, I mean, Onyx is a wonderful tool, but get yourself a, a laminated aerial photograph of your property and look at it from the 5,000 foot view, right? And then just, you can well, laminate a thing. You can take a, a erasable marker and mark on there and, and think about the different things about that property. Just sort of take, take stock of what you have. Um, you know, like this is where the water is. And then there's apps that you can put on your phone. Um, uh, uh, the plant identifying apps, I won't necessarily yeah, like one. Seek yeah, is one of them, I think. Yeah, Seek is the one actually that I have. An old man had, I uh, was forgetting there for a second. Um, uh, and that's fantastic that you're learning on your own a lot of what these things are. You don't have to be carrying a book around with you anymore. Yeah. You just click a picture. And that has been one of the most valuable tools for me. Um, and then I have Onyx on my phone and I'm constantly, I'm walking around. If I showed you my Onyx screen right now, I mean, there's layers in there. But of all the properties that I'm involved with, I've got all kinds of different notes. Some of it's deer hunting notes, some of it's turkey hunting notes, some of it's trails and all of this. But it's also um, cool stuff that I say. You take a picture and, you know, and that's what it is. So you're gathering information uh, about your property and then you know, learn about your, your watershed. Um, you know, I'm in the, in the little Baraboo River watershed here and I'm, our creek, our little trout stream here is unnamed, but it empties into McGlynn Creek. You know, know how everything is connected. Um, get involved with a, you know, if there's a neighborhood organization like a, you know, like an NDA chapter that might lead to a, a cooperative or something like that. Just kind of figure out who, what your neighbors are like and who your neighbors are. Is there, are there things that we can do together? That kind of goes back to some of that OG farming stuff. When I was a kid, when it came time to bale and hay, um, I'll tell you, part of the reason I got to hunt on other people's properties, because when it came time to bale and hay and they needed people stacking hay on wagons or unloading them, yeah, we got that call or they go by or you just knew you had to be there for it, right? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't in exchange for because the, they'd come and help you with yours too. But that was that community, that cooperation, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that that's a great opportunity for fun, but it's also that great opportunity for cooperation, for becoming neighbors, and you know, sort of everything's connected. And that's those connections. I think are super important. Yeah. What would you say would be like? I don't know, maybe your top two off the cuff twofer kind of projects. So when I say a twofer, I'm thinking of a project someone could do on the land that is great for deer and deer hunting, but also great for overall biodiversity or ecosystem health. Can you think of a couple of your top projects that would be good for both of those things that someone could be you know, listening today and say, okay, yeah, that's something I got to look into further that I could actually do, put on the ground. This coming year, top two. Sure, um, creating edge and feather edging. Like um, in our case, there's um, and, and a lot of around here and guys that I know, people that I know that own property, you know, for recreation or hunting, is that you see a lot of these hard edges, right, where the trees go straight up and here's the edge of the field and that's what it looks like. And what we really want is more of this. Um, so feather edging is is one of those things. There you need to learn how, you know, what's good and what's bad, right? Yeah. I mean, good tree, good tree, bad tree, good shrub, bad shrub. But those are the kinds of things that you're immediately creating um, habitat along a field edge. And especially if it's kind of a, you know, it's not a productive field or, or what, I mean, when I say field, I mean openings. Um, you know, that's one of them. Um, um specifically for deer or just in in general um, two first so one that'd be good for, something that's good for deer and overall biodiversity or ecosystem health yeah well so feather edging is one of them because that provides so much it provides both for deer and it also provides for everything yeah. else um and uh and that's really one if you get the opportunity and you get involved with uh, conservation departments and nrcs there's and get funding for that too so so um uh so that's one of them um well, i was gonna say food plots but i can't say that <laughs> <laughs> you do your super um, diverse uh, native seed food plot that sounded cool yeah no and that's that's actually what i'm uh 
what I've got going on uh, coming up this spring is uh, we're doing a pollinator habitat. Um, part of a conservation stewardship program, I've been involved with so many different things that the CSP program is for, for folks who've been involved with a bunch of different programs. So part of my uh, agreement this uh, time around is I wanted to do these things anyway, um, but is to, to do these, uh, the pollinator habitat, um, and, and you can look at what seed mixes are, are part of that. Uh, and the pollinators are really interesting, but man, a lot of that stuff is grasses and forbs. And so it's not only just for pollinators, yeah. but it's for, you know, uh, it's for a lot of the bird uh, species, but then deer get in there and eat that too. Um, and it's great bedding because there's going to be big grasses along with those forbs. Um, up to game birds utilize that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, the perennial, uh, the perennial food plot, and in this case, calling it um, really what, what we're doing, which is the uh, pollinator habitat. Yeah. Um, and those are, we're transitioning those too. That's, I guess, an important point on ours is that we're, uh, there's a pollinator habitat that's being connected to another pollinator habitat there, uh, with, we're feather edging all the way along the edge of the road that goes up to it. So there's almost like this, you know, connectivity. Um, one other thing that I would mention that I did, uh, it's coming up on 10 years ago now is on a real steep slope back here. I, I, I didn't think I'd ever plant another pine tree because of some things, but we planted um, pines on some real steep slopes back here um, as a part of our, and in, in, uh, as a part of a part of our plan that land that, you know, we've been, farm and it was on a side hill like this and we planted trees in that we probably plant, planted pines exclusively and it formed a uh it formed a you know a, a connection a, a wildlife connecting uh, area and i thought well the deer are going to use that a lot but it's been amazing i've got a, a trail camera back there how other species are using that as well <laughs> and then of course there's thermal cover and all of that yeah. for the deer as well so uh, I really want to see more hardwoods planted in our area. We it seems like we have plenty of pines, but then I'm, you know, contradicting myself and I planted four acres of uh, four acres of, of, of pines back here on these hillside strips. And they, they worked out really well for a lot of different species, but deer love them. That's great. That's three. Three good ones, Doug. So if I didn't have to, um, if I didn't have to go and, and make sure my son got picked up from school at a relatively uh, punctual time, I would say we could talk for another hour on this, but uh, but we can't. So I, I guess I I want to I want to do this again in more detail because there's still I, I'm I'm diving deep into this world, Doug. You'd be you'd be happy to know that I'm going further and further um, down the trail in your footsteps, trying to find ways to to expand my habitat horizons and impact. Um, but since we can't do it right now, if I wanted to, or if anybody else wanted to go more into these ideas, dive more into the stuff, could you give us some recommendations? Is there any of your own content of your own work that's out there right now that you'd recommend we go see? Um, I know there's some cool short films that came out within the last year or so. Maybe that's something you want to plug um, and then plug anything else of your own as well as if there's any other books or content from anyone else that you think would be worth us checking out to get deeper into this idea of, you know, creating land or creating Leopold landscapes, this bigger picture kind of work. Sure. Um, reach out to my friends at the Elder Leopold Foundation. Go to their website, the Elder Leopold Foundation.org. Um, that's just a wealth of, of Leopold stuff. Um, I've been writing and um, working with um, uh, Savage, and we did Savage Arms Company and Onyx, and, and, and both of those, um, I wrote some articles about, you know, chronic wasting disease, and this year now, coming up, I'm going to be doing more work um, with Savage about, um, about exactly this conversation, right, um, the, the philosophical stuff. Um, but if you go onto my website, DougDuran.com, oddly enough, um, you can find um, some of my content there. Um, you go on Sharing the Land and you can see uh, some of the content there. Um, we will be doing more about farm um, this year again. And uh, there's some short stuff about uh, about sharing the land that I think is real um, 
is really important. And um, so sharingland.com, Doug uh, You can just kind of dig around in there. And uh, I really encourage people to watch the video that's on Savage's uh, website. Um, it's actually part of their Serve the Land series. It's a 22-minute video about Leopold and the Riley Game Cooperative. And you can pretty much figure out, I'm in it for like two seconds, but um, but I was part of the production of the whole thing and, and put it together. Um, and I wrote about Leopold there and how he's influenced me, but also that really introduces the idea and the thought process. The how-to is one thing. How to think about it, I think, is really you know, basic level, developing a conservation philosophy. Think about that. What, what's my place in the world? So I know I just threw all kinds of stuff at you, but that's who I am, I guess. All good stuff, Doug. We wouldn't expect anything less. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you talking about this with me. And I um, hope we get a chance to do it again soon. Yeah, I, I hope so too. So say hello to uh, Everett and... and Colt. Uh, Colt. Yep. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope to see you guys again soon. And, uh, you know, thanks for the involvement and everything with you that, you know, I have been involved with. It was fun meeting you up on that, uh, on that trip in Alaska, but the back 40 stuff I think was really important. And, um, yeah, man, I'm a big That's, admirer of yours. I appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you again for, uh, for sharing the land. It was, uh, it was a heck of an experience down there with you. I had so much fun and, I can't wait to share that story with the rest of the world. I think folks will enjoy it. And um, I will always look back on that fondly. So uh, and that's cool. And I, one last thing, man knows how to run a chainsaw. <laughs> I was I impressed, man. I was, yeah, yeah. I knew I was like, I was watching him in the skid steer. You all see it. I was like, yeah, Mark knows what he's doing. Yeah, I like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I was surprised by that, but I kind of was. <laughs> I don't know if that's an underhanded compliment or not, Doug. But I'm going to take <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, nonetheless. that's the way I am. Right. <laughs> All, right, All right, let's talk again soon. All right, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed that one. Appreciate you being here, and let's just send it on out here quickly. Until next time, thank you, and stay wired to hunt.